Thank you, Pastor Bill. Thank you, everyone, for your welcome. And it is uh, great to have the opportunity to take part in the uh, Jesus the Game Changer series. Uh, we uh, felt this was an important series uh, to, to bring to you uh, because uh, sometimes uh, we need reminding. Uh, the Bible tells us to remember uh, the things of the past and how God has acted in the past and in history uh, to bring us to where we are to today. And uh, a lot of the world that uh, we live in today and that experience, especially in Western civilization, is as a result of what uh, Jesus taught uh, and how he lived and, and what he brought to the world uh, 2,000 years ago. And obviously the time between his life on earth and, and here today it gets a bit longer uh, each time. And, and sometimes uh, there's a, a lack of memory or a failure to remember uh, why things are the way they are today because of the influence of Jesus Christ. And uh, in, in modern Western nations, it can be hard to grasp uh, what it was like to be a woman or in the place of a child uh, at the time that Jesus uh, came to earth. Uh, now, it's true that there are still you know, struggles for women to gain parity in, in many different ways, uh, discussions about salaries. Uh, and uh, last year in the entertainment industry, uh, we saw that you know, it's still possible for women to be abused by powerful men. That is still true. Uh, and, but these attitudes need to be challenged uh, by the teaching of Jesus Christ uh, and should not be part of a society where uh, we believe in the equality of women and men. But we believe that primarily because of the way that Jesus behaved towards women, what he taught about women and what the New Testament has to say to us about the role and the relationship between men and women. I want to begin by just going through briefly some of those incidents and, and some of those things uh, that occurred in relation to uh, Jesus' attitude with women. And we know from Luke's Gospel that women actually played uh, an important part in his ministry uh, and uh, the ministry of, in fact, his 12 disciples. We read uh, in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, uh, that Jesus had uh, some key women uh, as part of his team, as it were, uh, and he spells out who they are, and we will take a look at that scripture right now. Uh, firstly, there was Mary, uh, who uh, Mary Magdalene, who we read had uh, uh, seven demons driven out of her. Uh, there was also uh, a lady called Susanna, uh, who um, uh, also was someone that supported Jesus' ministry. And we see in that passage that uh, Jesus uh, was uh, and his disciples were supported by these women who were women's of mean, of mean. Sorry, they weren't mean women; <laughs> they were women's of means. It's better to be a person of means than a mean person every day. And uh, um, what we see there is that these women must have had some sort of uh, significance uh, in their society uh, because, firstly, they were women of means. One of the three women mentioned in that passage in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, uh, was uh, also the wife of the manager of Herod's household. Uh, so that was also uh, uh, something that was uh, significant at that time. Uh, so, uh, but in generally speaking, however, uh, women who, who are in positions of wealth or, or significance or influence were few and far between. But Jesus relied on these particular women at, this, at that time uh, in order to uh, conduct his ministry and for the 12 to be supported because they had a three-year period uh, where uh, they weren't working, they weren't employed, uh, but instead uh, they were supported by these particular women. So it would have cost a bit of money. These were, you know, generally working uh, men. Uh, so I assume they ate a fair bit uh, and uh, they would have needed quite a few resources to be supported by that team. We also see that when it comes to uh, the uh, crucifixion of Jesus, uh, that uh, uh, Jesus, in fact, revealed himself uh, firstly to a woman. And this is quite significant because in those days, 
Uh, the testimony of women was not accepted in courts. Uh, it wasn't possible uh, for a woman to give evidence in a legal situation. So if you were trying to provide evidence, if you were just, say, making the story up of Jesus' resurrection, uh, you wouldn't have uh, chosen uh, a woman uh, as part of this fabricated story for that to occur unless that's exactly what happened, unless that absolutely was the reality. So we see that in John uh, chapter 20, verses 11 to 16, which I think we've got up on the screen. Uh, if we can put that up there, that'd be great. Um, that uh, uh, Jesus uh, goes through this exchange and, and Mary and the other women had gone to Jesus' tomb uh, because uh, they wanted to anoint his body uh, and they were honouring who he was. And if you could say that Jesus honoured them by revealing himself to them. And he goes through this exchange with Mary uh, where she does not realise that it's him, uh, but then after speaking to her, uh, he says, Mary, uh, I am Jesus, and she acknowledges him as teacher. And so Mary becomes, steps into history as the first person who ever recognised uh, the resurrected Jesus. Uh, and uh, uh, for that sense, she holds a very important place uh, in the story and the life and times of Jesus. So women were central to Jesus' ministry. They were, uh, uh, were found at key points of Jesus' ministry. But then uh, Jesus uh, also uh, took the opportunity to uh, talk about the opportunities that women should be afforded in a very powerful way. And most of you are well aware of the story uh, that occurred when Martha and Mary uh, were hosting Jesus and his followers at their home and uh, the impact uh, that that had and the teaching that that, that uh, had provides us with today is quite significant. Most of us associate uh, with uh, that story uh, that it's a teaching about being busy and, and not missing our devotional time and uh, that we should, uh, you know, not get stressed out and make sure that we pray and that type of thing. And, and that, is, that is something, uh, an important part of the story in relation to this, but there's actually something else going on. So let's read it together from Luke chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 38 to 42. If we can read that now and have that on the screen, that'd be fantastic. There it is. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had, that had to be made. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now, I don't know what your prayer life is like. If we can just go back to that for a minute before we move on, that'd be great. I don't know what your prayer life is ever like. Have you ever prayed a prayer to Jesus saying, Lord, uh, don't you care? <laughs> Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Lord, don't you care that my sister is... Let Have you ever prayed a prayer that said, Lord, don't you care that I am doing all the work? Is that, I don't know. Is that a prayer you've ever prayed? Come on, be honest. I think we've all prayed a prayer like that. So uh, uh, Martha, she goes for that prayer. She goes, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? And then she backs that up. She's not satisfied with that. Then she says, tell her to help me. And we see that uh, in this narrative, it's saying that Martha was distracted by all the preparations. And that's really interesting because I don't think most of you are probably thinking, well, I don't know if getting ready to host people uh, for a function is a distraction. Uh, someone's got to do it. Uh, you know, we've got to eat. Uh, it's important that the place is clean. Most would say, no, that's not, a that's not a distraction. That's a priority. But using the word distraction here in this story is trying to tell us that there's something more important going on at this moment. And part of that situation is reflected in the phrase that Mary was sitting at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, most of you, if you think about that, you think, well, 
okay, uh, what's, what's that supposed to mean? But that, that picture that's created there is a very important one, let me explain. Jesus, as we know from the resurrection story, was considered to be a teacher. Uh, he was uh, acknowledged as a, as a teacher within the community. And when you were seen as a teacher within the community, it was normally expected that you would have disciples. We, we might call them students or, or followers, that people would follow you around and that you would teach them. That was sort of part of the role, the clues in the name. But the way that teaching would occur is that the uh, teacher would stand up uh, and that his disciples would sit at his feet. That was sort of the way that it was set up those days. I don't know if they had chairs or not. According to the movie, uh, The Passion of the Christ, Jesus invented the chair when he was a carpenter. I don't know if you caught up with that. It's an interesting idea. He might have. But anyway, unless there was no chairs. There was only people at sitting people's feet. That's how you taught them. So for, especially for the first readers of that story, they said, hang on. Usually, there was no way that a woman would be the disciple of a teacher. That was a male-only domain. Uh, you would never uh, have a woman following in that sense and being taught by a rabbi. So when the first readers of this story look at that, say, hang on a minute, what is Mary doing in a place that is meant only for males uh, sitting at, their, at the feet, learning from Jesus. What that is, she is way out of line. She is doing wrong. She, and when they see that, that Martha is saying to the Lord, tell my sister, uh, she's not doing the work that she ought to be doing, she's left it all to me, tell me to help. They, they're thinking, mate, there's only one answer to that situation. There's only one thing that Jesus can say, and that is, Mary... Get back to the kitchen with your sister. Surely that would be the right response. Isn't this right, church? Well, you're not sure. Let's find out how Jesus reacted. Okay, move on. Next verses. Thank you. Martha, Martha, you are quite correct in what you say. Get back to the kitchen. No. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed. Indeed, at this moment, the Lord says, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus acknowledges and tells Mary that, in fact, you're worried and you're stressed about many things. Now, is this a teaching about worry and about anxiety? I think that occurs elsewhere in the Bible. But Jesus is trying to say there's something that you, I believe as a woman, because it involves two women, uh, have a permission to choose. And Mary on this occasion has made the better choice. Mary is permitted and able to sit in the seat of learning. She is invited to be in the place of a disciple. And I, says Jesus, am not going to take that away from her. In fact, she has made the better choice. Now, friends, it's not that practical things in life don't have to be done. It's not that Jesus is ignorant of those things. What he's saying is, when I am in this house, when I am in this place, it is appropriate for all people to sit at my feet, men and women included. I am not introducing a way of learning and discipling and teaching that's segregated by gender. But in fact, everyone is invited to sit in this place, including your sister, and she has chosen to do that, and I'm not going to tell her to get back to the kitchen. I'm in fact going to say, I will teach you. You can be my disciple. You can sit in the place of learning. You are invited to be one of my followers. And this is why it's important that we never have a situation in church or by extrapolation in society where we say that you can't do that or you can't do this because you are a woman. But we in fact say that you are invited to sit at Jesus' feet, you're invited to be in the place of ministry or of learning, and you can be my disciple, male or female. Is this encouraging you today, church? So we need to understand that there is a picture going on here as well as a place of teaching 
that Mary was sitting in the place of discipleship and of learning and of following and that Jesus said she's permitted to stand there. Now, there was another important teaching. Uh, we're going to just say something about children before we turn back to the idea of male and female. And Pastor Bill, I think, might build a blip, little bit more on this. But there was another important incident when uh, we read in Matthew chapter 8 when Jesus uh, was uh, with his disciples. And if we can just go to that now and take a look at that passage, that would be great in Matthew chapter 18. And the first thing we notice about this is at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, we need a bit of context here. In those days, it was normal and expected in the Greco-Roman world to, to talk about your greatness. It was a way of actually extending and enhancing your reputation and uh, to talk about how great you are uh, was accepted and okay. Today, when somebody does that, it really jars. Wouldn't you agree? I remember as a little fella, I was only, I don't know, about 10 at the time, when Muhammad Ali used to walk around and say, I am the greatest. Now, I know Pastor Bill thinks he was, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, when I used to hear that as a little fella, I used to think, how can you say that? Even if you are the greatest uh, when it comes to boxing, like, well, you don't tell people that or, or you don't take that on for yourself. Even then, I knew instinctively in terms of our society at the time that was, that was weird. But back then, it was actually considered to be okay. However, Jesus is trying to help his disciples go through a process of change when it comes to what is greatness and whether they have permission to actually take it upon themselves. When they ask him who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, they think because we are your 12 disciples, and you're pretty good yourself, Jesus, uh, they think that, you know, they're going to get shuffled up the order somewhere and find themselves right in the greatness club, okay? We know that James and John came to Jesus and said, we want to sit at your right and your left hand when you come to your parents. Amazing request. And Jesus goes, you don't know what you're talking about. You're going to have to die for that and just get out of here, you know? He, but on this occasion, he tackles it slightly differently and he says, truly, unless I tell you, unless you change and become like a little, like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who welcomes, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Two things. Notice, firstly, Jesus acknowledges that the child of that time has a lowly position. Like, they're his own words. But Jesus says, there you need to stand in order to show true humility and enter the kingdom of heaven. But then he affirms the place of this child by saying, when you welcome a child, you welcome me. Now today, to say hello to a child when it comes into a room, that's no big deal. In fact, most people would consider that polite. Some people do ignore children. But, but today, we would never... Uh, have, you know, just say a family came to visit you and you said, you know, hello George, hello Mavis. I don't know where I went for those names that make me sound a bit old, doesn't it? It just came to me. But, but then you would say hello to the parents and then you would not say to the kids. We'd think that is very rude. But in Jesus' time, to ignore children was just normal, was just expected. They had no position whatsoever. We know from some of the teaching in Jesus, the game changer, that if a child was born uh, that was the wrong gender, sadly at that time, that often meant that if, if you were desiring a son and you had a girl, you would literally dump that child. Credible. But you'd expose them. It was called exposure. And, and this sense of the disposability of children and, and, and the fact that they were, you know, to be disregarded and ignored, Jesus uses one of the most vulnerable persons in society to say, actually, you need to stand in the position of this child, and in doing so, he affirms the value and the worth of a child. That idea came from Jesus Christ. This was revolutionary when it was written and acted out, 
And today, it's almost taken as granted and taken as established in Western society. It's not to say it's perfect, but the idea comes from Jesus Christ. He changed the game when it came to women and discipleship and teaching and learning, and he changed the game when it came to children. Now, a guy who gets a little bit of bad press when it comes to uh, women and the church is the Apostle Paul. And some of his uh, passages are quoted in isolation and, and he's represented as being misogynistic and, and you know, not a fan of women and that type of thing. But actually, when it comes to male-female relationships, the Apostle Paul wrote some of the most um, impacting stuff in history. And in this particular case, he calls for... Uh, what you might call a love and a devotion to women from their husbands that also was a game changer at the time and revolutionary. Let's take a look at it in Ephesians chapter 5, 25, 28 and 29. If we can have that on the screen, that would be super. There it is there. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does for the church. Now, this idea that a husband would uh, be devoted to his wife and love his wife, uh, even though, again, in most circumstances today, that would not be considered unusual, at the time, it was very different. The husband basically owned his family, his wife and his kids. They were his possessions. And in many ways, they served him and his purposes and his status and his authority and his mission and his vocation and all of those different things. Here, based on the teaching of Jesus that he's already given us, Paul is saying that, in fact, the husband needs to serve his wife and actually love her. And the key to this particular point is to reflect on how did Jesus love the church? All right, there's a question now. You get to participate. How, what is the major way that Jesus loved the church? Say that, Cass. Laid down, Laid down his life. Well, surely he didn't mean that. I mean, that'd be a bit silly, wouldn't it? Didn't he mean, when he said love, didn't he mean, oh, yeah, you know, think nice thoughts? So a few nice words, that was a good dinner. Isn't that, didn't, isn't that what the Apostle Paul meant? He said, just as Christ loved the church. Men, those of you who are married, have you accepted the fact yet that you are called by Holy Scripture to die for your wife on, in, a, in a, both a literal basis as well as, as, well as a, what would you call it, Say that again, Phil. Metaphorical. I was going for that, but I thought, I might not get it right. <laughs> Thanks, Phil, for helping me with that. He gets all my pronunciations right there in the front row. I know uh, I, when I contemplated this scripture the first time, what this scripture is saying is, men, you get to die first. So, so, so I need you to put yourself in a picture for a moment where your family is in mortal danger. Just, just see if you can go there. I don't know what it is. And, and there's choices to be made about who gets the most danger in this situation. And I don't know if you've thought about it, but you either go first into danger or you stay last into danger. And that is your role as given by the call of Jesus Christ on your life. Now... I don't know. There might be guys here thinking, Pastor David, I've thought about this a long time. I'm ready to die for my family. No problems. Maybe you're there. Maybe you know all about this. Maybe you read your Bible and, and, and you know that that's something that you have to do. But I know that as a young husband and as a, as a father growing up, I realised that there'd be no, you know, I, that is something that I have to do for my family that I would have to die for them if necessary. And I remember sitting around the tea table once, and I don't know how it came up, but I, I told my kids, I actually told them, and, and husbands, I encourage you to do this for your wife and your kids too. I reckon you ought to do it. 
And I said to them, if it was necessary, I would die for you. I would die for you. And I remember my son, Josh, who, he's a pretty intelligent guy. He's looking at me and his eyes are open, his mouth is open. Because the thought that his dad would die for him, I think, well, I don't know, I guess it, I shocked him, really. Maybe he would be sad that I wouldn't be there. But I actually went on and said to him, I said, listen, I know you'd be upset if I had to do that, but I want you to know that I'm only doing what Jesus has called me to do. And after you get over your grief, remember that I acted with honour because I loved you and your mother and your sister with the love that Christ had for the church. So, friends, a couple of things. If you're prepared to die for your wife and your kids, if you've said all that in your heart, I think it then gets the rest of your behaviour to fall into line with that. Because if you're willing to die truly in your heart for your family, then I'm assuming you're not acting like a pork chop, you know, What's, you know, what, what am I watching on telly? You know, bring me my slippers, bring me my pipe. I don't know if anyone... Does anyone use slippers and pipes anymore? I mean, George and, maybe George and Mavis used them. I don't know. But we need to update, don't we, Bill? I'm still using stuff from the 60s to illustrate sermons. I'm about 50 years behind. You know, you sit there and, you know... Uh, and I had to learn that, you know. I used to, you know, love watching footy and... but. My wife and I had to negotiate these things and I couldn't watch the footy whenever I want. We've got it worked out quite well now. Men, I'll just give you a quick tip. Friday nights, the footy's on. What you, what you do is you watch the first half and then you turn on to Better Homes and Gardens. It, it, so Jude gets to watch and then you come back and you catch the very end of the footy. It's fantastic. Love your wife as you love yourself. You can't watch the whole game. You've got to share with what's going on there. Okay, so, so men, you get to die first. The, and, and then, you know, some people get really upset with a passage about one that talks to wives about submitting to their husbands. I guess what we would say is, well, would you be willing to submit to someone who's prepared to die literally for you? Because that's what it's all about. That's actually mutual submission. And that's where it comes from. Okay, how are we going so far? We're going all right. Let's talk a little bit now about what this means in terms of real outcomes in our life. Because while we've been talking about um, these aspects, we need, to con we need to confront some realities that occur in our world today. Uh, as I've said, uh, in many different circumstances still today, uh, there are opportunities that, that women are denied or they are objectified in ways that shouldn't occur just because they're a woman. They're a woman. Um, and I see in the Jesus the Game Changer video that uh, some of you might see in your life group this week uh, that uh, there is a woman called Jo Vitale who makes this statement. And it's a profound statement. I wanted to read it to you as we're starting to head towards the end of our message. She says this, she says, I've found a freedom. This is a woman who became a Christian uh, later life. I found a freedom that I don't see anywhere else in our culture. A freedom from being objectified, from being seen as just a sexual object. A freedom to become who God has called me to be in every aspect of life. And it's not about meeting cultural expectations and what society says I have to do. It's about who does God call me to be. Friends, that is an absolutely justifiable experience, if you like, that she should report to us, uh, this, this person. And it makes sense when you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When the Apostle Paul wrote this, consider this firstly, he obviously, he obviously was not dispatching with gender. <laughs> he wasn't saying there are no longer men and women. That's not what he's talking about. But what he's setting up here is he firstly picks on the historical divisions when it came to people who followed God. The first is Jew and Gentile. 
When you were a, a member of God's original people, you were very much considered a Jew and everyone else was a Gentile. And the Apostle says, that's gone. That's over now. The, the, the new creation, the new people that God has created are now one. They're no longer delineated by where they were born. Sound familiar? I mean, that's over. Everyone today is called to be Jesus' disciple and Jesus' follower. Secondly then, he talks about slave and free. That uh, at times we know from history, uh, free people and those in slavery were considered to be two different classes of people. There was just, it almost like there was, you were created for slavery and, and that was your station and there you stay. The Apostle Paul says, that's over. That breakdown, if you like, in social or class is gone. And then he picks up male and female. And, and when you think about it, him including this in this statement is a powerful, profound statement. And he says, the new creation, the new reality because of Jesus is that those, those things that used to divide us because of our gender are over. Those things that used to be excluded from us or excluded from women because of their gender, that's over. That, that, that division has been broken down. That the new creation and the new reality is now different and that is the world that we are to step into. Now the fact is that at times our culture, if you like, is at war against that. While some would say that you know, Western culture is undergirded by Christian belief, in some sense that's true, but in many other senses today, still in our world, women and children still experience uh, discrimination, experience hardship for no other fact other than they are a woman or a child. And the list that this might include uh, could go on. I've written some things down that I, I guess we could rattle off. Uh, sex slavery and the trafficking of, trafficking of women and children globally continues to be an enormous challenge. And the Rahab ministry that DARE has supported this weekend that Pastor Bill explained is specifically set up to stop that. Um, I uh, went to, uh, I actually visited Pastor Paulette Cairns uh, on another matter at her Rahab ministry here in Adelaide. They visit brothels, uh, I think, two or three nights. So we have done it for, I think, 20 or 30 years. Incredible ministry. And she said, some of the women that we meet, uh, they've just come from overseas. They've been trafficked here, here in Australia, in our suburbs. No identity, no papers, no nothing. They've ended up working as a sex worker here in Adelaide because someone's abducted them or tricked them or whatever and brought them here to do that. And I'm just, every time I think about that, especially as a, you know, a married man, of course, but also as a father of a daughter, that just kills me. Yeah. And I can't believe that, that our state would be on the edge of decriminalising sex work as if my daughter is going to receive a presentation at high school that's saying one of your options is to go and sell your body for sex. I mean, I'm sorry, folks, but that, I can't believe that that could happen in our society. And that's where Western civilization starts to head off down another path where the teachings of Jesus go out the window. So it's not about that it should be illegal or the police should be busting people. It's that we say as a society, that's not a free way for you to act as a woman. That's not an honourable, credible way for you to live as a person. Not stand up at a careers thing and say, well, here's an option. Now, save us from that. That Jesus would ever, that, 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 that would ever happen in our world. We're, we're on the edge of some very important things here. Abortion is spoken about, uh, let's decriminalise it. And it sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, let's not call anyone a criminal who has an abortion. What they mean is, let's deregulate it completely so there's no guidance from our legal system or nothing that's added to say, this is the right thing to do when it comes to treating the child that's inside of you. That's all it is. It's saying, that's not safe for you. That's not good for you. That's not so good for the child that's alive inside of you. So it's not about decriminalising it, it's saying we're taking off all the rules so that you can make your own decision. 
I didn't intend to drift off into this area, but here we are. Then we have things like uh, objectified images of women uh, in advertising and media that puts pressure on women to live up to certain images and expectations, cosmetic surgery, pornography, bringing expectations into male-female relationships that are demeaning to women and unrealistic. Domestic violence continues to grow in Australia where women's, women die or are hurt at the hands of their partners and ex-partners. These things as a society we need to say no to constantly, repeatedly, because of the image, if you like, or the teaching or the example that Jesus brought into our church, into the church and into our society. Secondly, every male must reconsider again how they look at women, how they think about women and how they treat women in light of what Jesus has taught and in light of what Jesus has said. In a culture that celebrates the freedom and opportunity of women, we are also a culture that continually objectifies women and judges them on how they look rather than who they are. Someone challenged me as a young father that I needed to be careful about saying to my daughter repeatedly, you're beautiful, without also remembering to say other things about who she is as a person. Because by the end of her teenage years, she thinks the only thing that dad thinks that I'm good at is being beautiful. And that's not good enough. We need to, we need to do better than that as fathers and as men, as husbands. We need to understand and encourage our women, not just in how they look, but in what they might do with their life, in their faith in Jesus Christ, in their discipleship of him as they step into ministry and mission and other vocations in our society. So we need to check, men, what's coming out of our trap and understand how it influences, subtly or otherwise, those who are around us. Is this okay, folks? Are you ready to step up to this, men? We would also say, and I just want to say this, I, I, I hope... This is not something, now I'll st that, that uh, takes away the impact. Let's say it in a different way. If there was any male here that was taking any encouragement from the scriptures that somehow ruling with an iron fist in their home and, and perpetuating domestic violence somehow because you're the head of the family and you've got this license to ride roughshod over your wife and your kids, if you're taking any encouragement that you've seemed to have justified that from the scriptures, you are dead wrong. You are absolutely way out of line with what Jesus is calling you to do as a father and as a husband. All right? If that's a problem for you, and it is if you're doing it, then you need to stop now and you need to see someone urgently about remedying that situation. A pastor, a counsellor, a friend, but don't think that it's okay for it to continue. Are you hearing me straight this morning, church, on this? Yeah. Well, I'm very clear about this. That's never part of a Christian home. And if it is because of you, it's a problem. And it's got to stop. Secondly... Thirdly, sorry, women, you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of your creator God. Jesus lifted your place and the dignity given to you. You should not be judged on your appearance. You are not a sexual object. Christ has given you the freedom to live life, being the person you have been created to be. Live in that freedom. Rise up. Rise up. Don't accept something that Jesus has not spoken over you, a limitation, a, a, a stereotype, a, a whatever it is that he has not given to you. But let him speak freedom over you and be that woman and that girl that you were called to be. Do that today. And I would say to you in relation to domestic violence, if you are a person that somehow was thought from the teachings of Scripture that suffering domestic violence is something that is part of your lot in life, I want you to stop that straight away as well. Because that's not your destiny in life. It's not your mission in ministry to somehow be in that position. You need to ask for help today and speak to a pastor or a leader and, and put an end to that. Because that is not Jesus' plan for your life. And it's not your calling as a wife to have to go through that at all. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were indeed a Lord and a Saviour who came and turned life on its head for so many. You were the game changer in the original form and you are still the game changer today. And Lord, we thank you especially for the way that you changed the way that we view women and children in our society today. We thank you for the lives that have been lifted up because of your example, your teaching, and Lord, your sacrifice on the cross that showed all people how they were to live for each other in a way that was sacrificial, giving, devoted, and in particular, the call that you placed on men and husbands' life when it came to ministry to women and children. Lord, we also thank you for the destiny that you have released into the church and into our society through the lives of women that would not have occurred if you had not have come. That you have literally shaped history because of what women have done in the church and beyond. Because you said you may sit in the place of discipleship. You can be in the place of learning. You will be a follower and you've chosen the better thing and you can do it. Lord, I pray that everyone here today would just receive that calling that's on their life, male and female, children as well, would see their destiny found in you. Lord, the only way it can happen is if we say yes to you, if we receive you as Lord and Saviour in our life. And Lord, this we seek in your name. Amen.